Well, hello, everyone. <laughs> it's good to be with you today. Uh, my name is Jeremy Orr, and I'm the lead pastor at our Hanley Road Church, and uh, they roped me into this one. <laughs> I was imagining being a baseball player, and they always have theme songs when they come up to bat, and mine was going to be, let's talk about sex, baby. <laughs> Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things and all the bad things life can bring. So uh, that's what we're going to do. Uh, and in order to uh, sort of ease into this, in order to get us in the mood, so to speak, uh, I thought I would start with a little bit of levity. Uh, I actually was asked to read this passage in its entirety, uh, which is frankly erotic, uh, at a friend of mine's wedding. So I was like, interesting choice, but I'll go ahead and do it. Uh, so I got up there and I read it and I sat down and, you know, I sweat a lot because I was nervous, but I got through it. And I went down to the fellowship hall where they were having their reception after the wedding. And uh, this 85-year-old woman started making her way right towards me. And I was like, oh, gosh. And she goes, young man. I was like, here it comes. She goes, I need to tell you something. This was my favorite wedding that I've ever attended. <laughs> and I was like, why is that, Grandma? And she goes, when you said the word breast, and you held out your arm and cupped your hand, I thought, now I've seen everything. And I just froze and walked away speechless and hurried over to my wife and said, honey, no, 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 no. Like, tell me I did not do this. <laughs> and she goes, no, you didn't do it. I watched you the whole time. You do lots of weird things with your hands, but you did not do that. And I was like, wait a minute. I do lots of weird things with, like, we got in a fight about that, okay? But I did not do that. And so I got to thinking about grandma and why it is that she might imagine something like this. And I, uh, I didn't want to think about that very much. But what came to me is, Grandma, sometimes I think you see what you want to see, all right? Uh, so I realize that when you read a text like this, and when we talk about this, uh, it evokes a lot of things. It makes us nervous. Uh, it brings up shame. It brings up guilt. It brings up frustration. It brings up longings. It might even bring up uh, memories of abuse or traumatic experiences. Uh, to talk about sexuality is to go in, into the deepest parts of our stories, and uh, it requires sensitivity, and it's difficult, and there's no way that I can address every part of the full spectrum of what we have all experienced. Uh, but I do want to say what God's Word says about this today. Uh, and, and I was thinking, you know, what is it that qualifies me to talk about this? Uh, and I think the obvious answer is that I'm a sexual icon, so you're welcome for that. <laughs> Uh, but uh, more truthfully, um, in seven years as a pastor at The Journey, I've actually never directly talked about sexuality, and I think it's because God knew that I, I wasn't ready until now, uh, because uh, sexuality is the part of my life in which I have experienced the most brokenness, much of it my own doing. Uh, but sexuality is also the part of my life in which I have experienced uh, the most of God's healing and help and love. Uh, I've needed God in my sexuality more than anywhere else, and God has been faithful in my sexuality more than anywhere else. So I don't speak uh, as a man who is perfect or who has arrived. Uh, I rather speak as one who knows great brokenness uh, and even at times utter despair. Uh, but I also speak as a man who has experienced uh, recovery from addiction, uh, power, freedom, and even at times, utter delight. Uh, so it occurred to me that in many ways I've lived almost every verse of Proverbs 5, both the agony of sexual immorality and the ecstasy of marital fidelity. And so what I want to do is just walk through God's Word and sort of weave in my own story in the hopes that we would all feel uh, that Jesus Christ is a God who is merciful and who desires uh, to heal us and help us in our sexuality. Uh, so I've broken this text down into three parts so that we can follow it easily and we'll just walk them together. I'll tell you what they are right up front and then we'll go through them. Uh, the first six verses, uh, we have a temptation. 
right? It's a father who's warning his son about sexual temptation. Uh, In verses 7 to 14, the father talks not just about the temptation, but the trap. He warns his son about the consequences of sexual immorality. And then in verses 15 to 20, we have uh, the turnaround. It's a father who is urging his son to cultivate a great sexual relationship with his wife. So it's the temptation, the trap, and the turnaround. That's what we'll go through. So I'll start with the temptation. Uh, Here's what it says in verses 1 and 2. And if you have your Bibles, you can look or read along. Uh, It says, My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion and that your lips may guard knowledge. So what is this saying? It's saying in the Bible, sexual education is actually the responsibility of parents and the church. So parents are supposed to teach their sons and daughters about sex. And the church is supposed to say what God says in his word about sex. And God talks about it a lot. So let me just give you an overview, right? Uh, Sex is a beautiful gift made by God for his glory and our good. That a man and a woman are supposed to leave their father and mother and cleave to one another and become one flesh to have sex for the purposes of pleasure and procreation, but also for the purposes of renewing their covenant. Sex in many ways is, is supposed to be a renewal of your vows where you once again express your loyalty and commitment and affection and blessing towards one another. And the Bible says spouses are supposed to be naked and without shame. Uh, So sex isn't dirty. Uh, Sex isn't merely an animal appetite like hunger or thirst. Uh, Sex is beautiful and powerful and holy. It's God's gift to a married couple. God made sex and God loves sex. And our kids are supposed to be knowledgeable about God's desires for their sexuality so that they have categories in their heads and words on their lips so that when sexual temptation comes, which it will for every single one of our kids, just as it's come for every single one of us, both from without and from within, our kids won't be duped or fooled or blindsided. Right, so uh, here is the Christian sex ethic. Uh, C.S. Lewis states it brilliantly in mere Christianity. Uh, This is what he says. We must now consider Christian morality as regards sex, what Christians call the virtue of chastity. And this next sentence is one of my favorite lines in all of Lewis. He says, um, chastity is the most unpopular of the Christian virtues. (laughs) Like, it did not get picked for the team, right? Boo, chastity. Uh, There's no getting away from it. The Christian rule is either marriage with complete faithfulness to your partner or else total abstinence. That's the Christian rule. Either marriage with complete faithfulness to your partner or else total abstinence. Uh, Lewis continues. He says, now this is so difficult and so contrary to our instincts that obviously either Christianity is wrong or our sexual instinct as it now is has gone wrong. It's one or the other. And of course, being a Christian, I think it's the instinct which has gone wrong. Right, which gets us into verse 3. That we're all subject to sexual temptation because for all of us, our sexuality is broken. And when sexual temptation comes, here's how it comes. It comes dressed in a pretty and innocent-looking package where the pleasures are obvious and the dangers are hidden. It's like delicious bait with an invisible hook inside. Now look at verse 3. It says, For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. So it's two metaphors that we're supposed to take together, right? Uh, The temptress or the seductress. And in Proverbs 5, it just happens to be a woman, but it could just as easily be a man. Men can be temptees or temptors. Women can be temptees or temptresses. Uh, That's a hard word to say. The temptress... Uh, She says words, she communicates, she has a message, she has an offer that initially tastes like honey. But ultimately, it's as bitter as wormwood. It initially uh, goes down smooth as oil. But ultimately, it is mutilatingly sharp. Right? There are people who are seeking 
to profit from us and our lives and our sexuality. And if we don't have a plan for our lives, they do. If we're unprincipled and uncommitted and impressionable, if we have unaddressed wounds and fears and issues, there are men and there are women who will gladly seduce us so that we will join in their illicit sensual pleasures, which is why sexual immorality is so rampant and so easy to fall into. Right, so let me tell you what this looked like uh, in my own story. Uh, I had a total lack of instruction about sex. Uh, my parents never talked about sex. Uh, I finally got the sex talk at the age of 22, which is a little late. Uh, and there was a lot of verbiage from the 1950s, which surprised me. Uh, and there was a flip chart involved, which uh, has been the subject of many counseling sessions. Uh, so I, did you get the talk? Do you remember? Do you remember what was said? Do you remember how you felt? A lot of my friends never did. But my wife never got the talk. I actually only know one person, uh, one friend of mine, who said that they had a positive experience with the parental sex talk. Uh, so I didn't learn anything from my parents. Uh, my church never talked about sex. I started going to church in middle school and high school. Uh, they never said anything other than uh, don't have it. So uh, I was ignorant, right? I picked up snippets uh, from friends at school. But uh, believe it or not, I actually went through a very long, awkward phase in my life. Uh, some people would argue that I'm still in it. And uh, consequently, I didn't really talk to girls. I had three brothers. I played a lot of sports. I didn't talk to girls until much later in high school. And uh, part of that was God's mercy. But when I sort of emerged from this awkward phase and girls started showing interest in me, I had no idea how to handle it. And nobody helped me, right? I knew um, good kids don't have sex. Uh, so I wasn't going to do that because I was afraid of the consequences. Uh, but I was pretty interested in anything and everything leading up to that. Uh, and by the time I got to college, which I started in the year 2000, uh, they had just installed high-speed internet in all of the dorm rooms for the first time. Uh, and internet filters had not yet been created. Uh, so you have a young man, unprincipled, away from home for the first time, lonely, insecure, uh, in a stressful new environment uh, with tons of free time on his hands and uh, a new girlfriend who is not a Christian who wants to press the gas pedal on our physical relationship. And I have unfiltered, unfettered access to internet pornography 24-7, five feet from my bed. I mean, do you see what this is a recipe for? And this is so common. So I resisted porn and her for a while, and it started so slowly, so innocently, right? We would watch movies on the couch and lay down together and make out and would progress. Or I would get on sports sites, and then I would click on the swimsuit issue, right? And just scroll through a couple pictures. I mean, it was innocent, right? It's totally justifiable. I love beauty. These are beautiful women, right? I'm a red-blooded American male. Uh, I'm visual. I'm a guy. This is what we do. I'm just looking. It's not like I'm having sex with anyone. They obviously want to be looked at or else they wouldn't have taken the picture, right? These are all the things that I tell myself. It's just five minutes here and there. I can control it. Uh, it's an escape from my boredom, uh, my pain my loneliness, my homework. I feel alive in some way, and my girlfriend has said she's cool with it. So what's the big deal? What's the harm? Tastes like honey, smoother than oil. But he says, son, listen to me. You have to ponder the path of life, and you have to be on guard, and you have to be wise, and you have to have a plan for your purity, or else you will fall into this easy and terrible trap. So what's our plan? 
Uh, singles, dating couples, fiancés, which is the hardest time in my opinion, spouses. What's our plan? A few years later, when I started dating uh, the girl that would become my wife, Megan, uh, we made some rules to help ensure our purity. Uh, and we didn't follow them perfectly, uh, but when we messed up, we confessed to each other and to God, and we told a couple friends who were walking alongside of our relationship. Uh, and here, here's what we decided. Uh, we weren't going to kiss lying down. Uh, we weren't going to hang out in a house or apartment by ourselves. And we weren't going to hang out past midnight. And I got internet filters on my computer and all of my devices, and they sent comprehensive emails to a couple friends and to her. And I'm not saying that these have to be your rules, right? I think all of us can figure out what our plan needs to look like in order for us to pursue purity, and all of us can figure out which of our friends we trust to not judge us, but to actually help us as we seek to honor God with our sexuality. This is what the Father is saying to the Son. He's saying you have to have a plan because we're so easily tempted and because we're so good at self-justification. Right, when I, was, uh, when I was studying for this sermon, I just sort of took a walk down memory lane and m- uh, things just popped into my head. And I remember the first time that I progressed from like the swimsuit issue to like softcore pornography. And I, I remember thinking that a lightning bolt was going to come down from heaven because I knew it was wrong. And the lightning bolt never came. And you know what I did in that moment? I mistook God's incredible patience for his permission. And I said, maybe this isn't that big of a deal. Maybe he doesn't really care that much. Maybe it's not so harmful. Well, the father goes on talking to the son to answer that very question, (laughs) to debunk that very lie. In verse 7, he talks about the trap. The father spells out the consequences of sexual immorality. I'll read it to you, verse 7 and following. It says, And now, O sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner, and at the end of your life you groan. When your flesh and body are consumed and you say how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof and I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors, I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Uh, Derek Kidner, who's a commentator on Proverbs, uh, breaks this down into sort of three parts of the trap. And so I'm borrowing from his categories. Here's uh, the three parts Uh, in verse 9 and 10. He argues, if we don't stay away from sexual immorality, whether with porn or with people, uh, we will be exploited by others. In particular, if we give ourselves to sexual immorality in verse 9, we will get addicted. And we will give years of our lives away, our precious time uh, to the merciless. Uh, And you guys know how addiction works, right? We know how addiction works. Uh, functions. Addictions are predictable pleasures that take us out of the moment for a time. That we have some sort of painful experience either in our recent past or in our distant past, and we want relief. So we find these substances or these behaviors that give us some temporary relief, and we feel good for a little while, but they don't solve a problem. In fact, they make it worse. So what do we do? We go back for more. And you guys know how substance abuse works. The thing about our biochemistry, right, is that the next time we have to up the dosage in order to get the same high. It's called tolerance, right? C.S. Lewis talks about it as as an ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure. That's addiction. So we develop tolerance, and then we develop withdrawal, We try to quit and we can't. We have cravings. We have physical and psychological symptoms. We developed a real dependence on this substance or this behavior. And here's when the trap gets sprung. We start out using these things in order to make us feel better and numb the pain. 
but they actually cause us even more pain. And so now to deal with the more pain, what do we do? We go right back to the substance or the behavior, which gives us temporary relief, but even more pain. And then back to the substance and the behavior, temporary relief, but even more pain. And we end up in this downward spiral of addiction that many people characterize as a living hell. Because the ultimate end of all of addiction is disintegration. You cease to function as a human being because you're totally enslaved. So we do whatever it takes to feed our addictions. We chase the high. We risk greatly just to get our next fix. But we lie and we manipulate in order to keep the affair going or whatever it may be. So he says in verses 11 and 13, he says, look, if we don't stay away from sexual immorality with people or porn, uh, not only are we going to get addicted and exploited, uh, we're actually going to be condemned by our own consciences. So there's an inner psychological reality that comes with sexual immorality, right? So when my use of pornography began to grow, uh, I ended up spending hours on a daily basis viewing porn, and I tried to stop, but I couldn't, and I knew it was wrong, and I knew it wasn't good for me, but I got to a point where I was uh, enslaved. And I remember very clearly some of the internal thoughts I had uh, during that time. I remember thinking, uh, this is just who I am now. I am always going to be addicted because I can't stop. I will be a forever slave to my evil desires. And I can't tell anybody uh, because it's so disgusting and perverse and childish. Like if people knew what I was looking at and what I was doing, uh, they would rightly reject me. They'd run in the other direction. So I'm just damaged and disgusting. And the best I can hope for is to just hide this and detach and numb because nobody would ever want to know or love me. Consciences get condemned and it takes us, as it did me, to a place of despair. Which is what it says in verse 14. If we don't stay away from sexual immorality, we're going to be on the brink of public ruin. Uh, Here's what this looked like in my life. By the time I was a sophomore in college, uh, I had really spun out of control. And uh, my self-will had just shriveled. And so I went from a very gregarious life of the party, extrovert, lots of friends, to being a recluse. I went from uh, school being something that was fairly easy for me to not even being able to force myself to get out of bed to go to class. I remember my sophomore year, I signed up for a class that I never attended. And in the eighth week of the semester, all I had to do was walk 200 yards to a building and ask to withdraw from that class so that it wouldn't go permanently on my record. And I didn't even have the willpower to do that. So I just took an F in it. I mean, I had become a shell of a man who was incapable of doing even simple things because of my addiction. It's where sexual immorality can take us, on the brink of public ruin in the assembled congregation. Uh, So what hope is there for us who are addicts? What's the turnaround? Uh, Let me tell you what happened for me. So the end of my sophomore year of college, uh, through my twin brother, I meet some new friends. uh, And it's a bunch of Christians. Uh, and they're sort of weird and quirky, but, uh, but I like them. And we start hanging out, we're playing sports, and they invite me to some stuff, and I go, and they give me some books. And at that point, I really wasn't much of a reader, but for some reason, I just, I just voraciously read through uh, two books at that time. Uh, they gave me Desiring God by John Piper and Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And uh, both of those men just talked about God in ways that I'd never heard anybody talk about God before. Uh, Piper, in particular, argues that um, God's glory and our happiness are actually one and the same, and that what God really wants is for us to be filled with happiness in Him. And I never heard anybody say that, 
and I was uh, intrigued, and I was enthralled, and I started reading through the book of Romans at this time, uh, and uh, I, I was searching. I was being drawn, but, uh, but I was still holding on to pornography and many other things, uh, and so one night, I go to sleep, and I have a dream. Uh, and here's what happens in the dream. It's sort of like an out-of-body experience where I'm looking at me, right? So I'm sort of an observer in the back. Uh, and the me in the dream is sitting in my chair in my sophomore dorm room uh, looking at pornography. And then I see a figure come into the dream, and I am certain that it's Jesus. And I'm terrified. And I'm so ashamed because he is watching me watching porn. And I feel so disgusted with myself. And this is what Jesus said. He quoted a verse I just read in Romans, uh, Romans 5, 8, which says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So in my moment of greatest guilt and shame, the God of the universe comes and does not issue a word of condemnation, but issues a word of forgiveness, grace, acceptance, and love to a man who feels no one will ever love him. And I woke up and I just felt born again. but I didn't stop looking at porn immediately. I wish that was my story, that it was just instantaneously ripped out of my life, right? <laughs> it wasn't. That was the beginning of the end. That was the most significant step in recovery, to be loved despite my flaws and addiction by God himself. But I also got into two years of therapy because I had to trace back some of the roots of my shame and my anger and my fear that led me to look at pornography and need that release valve. And a lot of it's based on my family of origin and I'm still exploring that to this day. I'm constantly learning more. I'm still recovering. I also got involved with a group of friends. It was five guys and we met every week, sometimes multiple times a week. And we were all struggling with pornography because it was the early 2000s and we were 19 and Napster, right? I mean, it's just <laughs> epidemic but we all wanted to be pure, and we all wanted to be honest, and we all wanted to pray for each other and walk alongside of each other so that we could be men of integrity. And, and here's what friends do, right? Um, friends will love you without judgment, and they'll try to help you. That's what friends do. Friends are people that um, you can tell your secrets, right? Not, not because you have to, because it's an accountability group, and that's what we do. Like, friends are people that you want to tell them your secrets because you trust them, and you know they love you, and they would never use them against you, right? Secrets have so much power in our lives. I mean, part of recovering from sexual immorality or pornography or any addiction is, like, 50% of the power of it is broken when you just tell somebody because secrets have so much power and vulnerability and confession rob them of their victory in our lives. So I met some great Christian friends, and we walked together. I also, I'd spent so much time doing, like, evil things with my hands that I, I wanted to, like, do beautiful things with my hands. So I bought a guitar, uh, and I spent hours, instead of looking at porn, I spent hours learning how to play the guitar. Uh, and I'm still not very good at it. But it was a way to take uh, ashes and to bring beauty out of them. Uh, I, I don't have like, here's the 10 steps to biblical recovery. I think it's different for everyone. Uh, but that's some of the elements that God used uh, in my life. Um, and like, so the conclusion of the sermon is not, uh, you know, recovered from porn, got married, and um, marital sex has just been easy and awesome and four times a week, and so should you, end of sermon. Uh, like, that's, 
That's not uh, how things have happened, right? There have been long-term lingering effects of my sexual brokenness uh, that have still invaded our marriage, that we're still working through in counseling as of two weeks ago. Uh, And this is what the father argues with his son. His final point is, look, a great sexual relationship doesn't just happen, right? Like, what other great thing in your life just happened, and it was easy, and it didn't take any work or any practice or any experimentation or any failures or, like, in that sense, sex is like everything else in a broken world, right? It, it, it is with difficulty and effort and courage that we cultivate good. So all those things are required, but you really can, we really can cultivate great sexual relationships with our spouses. Uh, And so I want to look at the last few verses, uh, particularly um, verse 19. All right, so uh, Bible translators get really squeamish about how unashamedly erotic the Bible is. And uh, like the Bible is in C-17 at certain points, right? Uh, There are parts of the Bible that like the Jews did not let uh, people read them until they turned 30 years old because they were nervous about what would happen if they read them. Uh, So, if you were to translate literally what verse 19 says and you didn't gloss over it because it made you uncomfortable, uh, this is what it says. It says, may your wife's nipples make you drunk. May her beauty make you staggeringly drunk. Right? It's figurative language. And the father in Proverbs, this is what he's telling his son. He's telling his son, that you can get such a high from sex with your spouse that it's far better than the high that the finest wine could give you or the most powerful narcotic could give you. But you you should be staggeringly drunk on the love of your spouse. Uh, And in the last few years, the Lord has started to let us experience some of this, right? I mean, I've already told you I've known moments in my sexuality of brokenness and addiction and utter despair. But I have also uh, known moments where I felt so in tuned and so connected and so one with my bride that we felt bulletproof, right? Like it's just you and me and there's no one else in the world. It's just you and me against everyone, and we could take them. We could win. We are unstoppable. We are at total peace with ourselves and the world. We're naked and unashamed. We are love drunk. Uh, I want to end just with a story of God's love and faithfulness uh, at a time in my life where I was feeling really frustrated on a whole bunch of levels. Uh, I felt like I had just been betrayed. I was uh, exhausted. I was really tired. We had just had our second little girl. And those of you that are parents know that there is a time after your wife gives birth where sex is just not going to happen. So it was just a difficult period, and I could feel within myself uh, that I was getting sulky and angry and self-pitying, and I could feel the allure of pornography coming into my heart and life as something I deserved and needed and that would provide relief. Uh, And that made me terrified. So I did something I'd never done before. Uh, I took a silent retreat I just went for a day and a half, uh, and I just spent it with the Lord, crying out for help, uh, asking him to talk to me, to speak to me, anything he wanted to say. Uh, And I'd never done this before. Uh, I had a whole day and a half of, like, unstructured time, which never happens for me. So I just followed whims. And one of my whims was uh, I went to a park, and I walked down a trail, and I saw a tree, and I'm like, I'm going to climb that tree. So I did. Uh, And I was on this tree over a creek, looking at a stream and praying. Uh, and we have a picture of it. Uh, I took a picture when I was up there. Uh, and here, here's what I saw before me, right? Uh, it was late September. I saw leaves falling down into this sort of like gentle wide part of the stream. But then like, and, and the leaves would 
the current would carry them. But then uh, the stream narrowed, and there were all these rocks protruding from the surface, uh, and essentially these leaves went through a gauntlet, and many of them got stuck and even torn on these rocks. But the stream kept flowing, and every so often uh, it would break one of the leaves free, and the leaf would float downstream into this big, wide, calm part of the creek. And I just felt the Lord saying, um, you're that leaf. I dropped you into the stream of my grace. And for a long time it was wide and peaceful. And you flowed with me. And now you've hit this gauntlet. And you're afraid you're going to get stuck. And this is what I want to say to you, Jeremy. Don't be afraid. My grace hasn't stopped flowing. I will get you unstuck and carry you downstream. That's actually what God promises us. 1 Thessalonians 5, here's what he says. He says, now may the God of all peace sanctify us completely. May he keep our souls and bodies blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our God who calls us is faithful. He will surely do it. Right? Jesus Christ isn't just a God who has forgiven our past sin. He is a God who is with us here today, right now, eager and willing to heal us and help us if we will come to him with humility and honesty and faith. And he is a God who has promised that he will carry us downstream, he will get us unstuck, and he will one day make us perfect and take us to be with him where he is forever and ever. Right? Our hope in saying no to sexual immorality, our hope in recovery uh, is not 12 steps. It's not a better performance from us. It's not more energy and effort. Our hope is the forgiving and empowering love of Jesus Christ who died so that we might live for him and with him. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we just need you. We need you. We need you to minister your grace to us. We need you to forgive our guilt. We need you to embrace us in our shame. We need you to heal us and help us. Lord, we are desperate for you. Many of us feel like the waves are about to overtake us. So, Lord, will you deliver? Will you rescue? Will you set us upon the solid rock of your love? And would you recover us so that more and more our sexuality is not broken but beautiful? Uh, Jesus, we ask these things in your mighty name. Amen.